To Plato's Pod, where we engage in a group discussion on selections from the complete works of Plato, the philosopher and geometer who wrote nearly 2,400 years ago. Today is January 21, 2024, and I'm your host, James Myers. It's an honor to welcome in discussion members of the Toronto, Calgary, and Chicago philosophy meetup groups. Whether you've been with us before or are here for the first time, whether you have experience with or are new to Plato's works, I encourage you to add your voice to our dialogue. Today, we're beginning our series on Plato's longest dialogue, The Laws. It's perhaps his most controversial, and supposedly his last, spanning 300 printed pages, which is about one-sixth of Plato's entire written output. Some claim that Plato left the laws unfinished, and although there are several newly published translations, the dialogue has received relatively little scholarly attention. With a very enigmatic approach to the subject of constitutions and laws, Plato doesn't make it easy for the reader. But the topic is perhaps especially timely now, 2,400 years later, with constitutional order across the planet fraying under disaffection and national laws that seem incapable of addressing problems of enormous international complexity. With nearly half the world's population heading to the polls to cast votes this year, is there any benefit to be drawn from the laws? I think we'll see some sections of the dialogue that speak almost directly to current circumstances. So as always, to contribute your thoughts to our discussion, please use the raise hands feature in Zoom. And for everyone's benefit, please relate your comments and opinions to Plato's text. So that everyone has a chance to speak, I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised, using first name only. Once we finish recording in two hours, I invite anyone who wishes to remain online for Plato's Cafe, a casual half-hour discussion on Plato or philosophy in general. We're beginning our exploration of the laws today near the end of the dialogue with Book 10, which we'll cover in two sessions before turning to Book 1. Today we'll discuss from 884a to 896e. Book 10 focuses on the order of the universe and the nature of the soul, which are the themes that pervade Plato's works, and in particular the Timaeus, which we revisited recently in three episodes, as well as the Philebus, the Atidas, the Republic, the Sophist, the Statesman, and the Cratylus. In decoding the laws, I thought Book 10 would be a relevant starting point to frame key principles underlying this dialogue, and indeed all of Plato's works. So before jumping in, though, some background for the dramatic setting of Book 10 is necessary. We'll hear three elderly men, representing different political systems, discussing the constitution and laws for a new colony that Crete is establishing to be called Magnesia. Near the beginning of the laws, they agree the best constitution is one that does not perpetuate war, but instead reconciles people and cultivates virtue. As we listen to them, we might ask whether the three characters are being faithful to their own principles. One character is Clinius, a Cretan citizen who will be charged with leading the new colony. The other two characters are Megillus, from Sparta, and an unnamed Athenian, who does most of the talking. When we get to the second half of Book 10 in two weeks, we might find some of the laws that the Athenian proposes to be particularly offensive from today's perspective. But then it's necessary to recall two things. Firstly, that Plato provides no personal endorsement of the Athenian's words. And secondly, that we should exercise our own reason, as we witness the three in discussion, to conclude whether the new colony of Magnesia will be successful the way they're constituting it. Can the theory and principles set out by the Athenian, Cretan, and Spartan actually be put into motion? The question recalls the problem of Plato's second longest dialogue, The Republic, which devotes nearly 250 pages to describe an idealized city that Socrates said the following day, at the beginning of the Timaeus, he could not envision succeeding when put in motion. The challenge with motion is the human soul, which Plato tells us is divided in three parts, consisting of need and desire, which are moderated by reason. If reason isn't exercise, then needs and desires can overwhelm any set of laws. Desire, in particular, presents a challenge that we might encounter in the colony of Magnesia. So I want to remind listeners of some of the important aspects of Plato's cosmology that we've encountered in the last 52 episodes of this podcast. These are especially important to understanding the nature of the soul and how the word God is defined in Book 10 of the Laws. I think it's critical to keep the following in mind as we review Book 10 and the rest of the Laws. That the universe is spherical, the universe itself has a soul, there is a universal distinction between infinite being and the limited representations of being in physical becoming, the universe consists of both the visible and the invisible, the soul consists of three parts, knowledge exists in a divided line, and the forms are the means of universal definition. 
If we lose sight of these fundamental platonic principles, I think we risk becoming lost in the complexities of the laws. So to help frame our discussion today, the notes I posted on the shared drive linked to the event notice on meetup.com arrange the first half of book 10 in three themes. First, we'll look at the nature of the soul and the definition of the word God, which we might find quite different from present religious interpretations. In fact, in two weeks, we'll hear the soul described at 890 C as a divinity. Next, we'll turn to the recognition of God, as God has been defined, in a constitution that embraces both believers and non-believers, as the three discuss the means by which the soul can be persuaded by reason. Then we'll consider, in the second hour of today's discussion, the logic of the Athenian, who defines soul as that which has the power of self-generating motion. As such, the Athenian asserts that metaphysical soul came into being before any physical matter in the universe. It's a very empowering, non-materialist vision of the soul, or two souls, as the Athenian concludes, one of which is good and the other of which is bad. Will we find holes in the logic, or does it stand to reason? So I hope this introduction is helpful to understand the context, and now I'll begin today's discussion by reading the passages from 891c to 892c, in which the Athenian and Clinias cast some light on the nature of the soul and definition of God. So this is 891c, uh, where the Athenian starts, Now then, Clinias, you must take your share in the explanation. So tell me your opinion again. I assume the upholder of this doctrine thinks of fire and water, earth and air, as being the first of all substances, and this is precisely what he means by the term nature. Soul, he thinks, was derived from them at a later stage. No, I do more than assume. I'd say he argues the point explicitly. Clinias says true. The Athenian continues. Now then, by heaven, haven't we discovered the fountainhead, so to speak, of the senseless opinions of all those who have ever undertaken investigation into nature? Scrutinize carefully every stage in their argument because it would be crucial if we can show that these people who have embraced impious doctrines and lead others on are using fallacious arguments rather than cogent ones, which I think is in fact the case. Clinias says, you're right, but try to explain their error. The Athenian replies, well, it looks as if we have to embark on a rather unfamiliar line of argument. Clinias says, don't hesitate, sir. I think you'll be straying outside legislation if we attempt such an explanation. But if this is the only way to reach agreement that the beings currently described as gods in our law are properly so described, then this, my dear sir, is the kind of explanation we must give. So the Athenian continues, so it looks as if I must now argue along rather unfamiliar lines. Well then, the doctrine which produces an impious soul also produces, in a sense, the soul itself, in that it denies the priority of what was in fact the first cause of the birth and destruction of all things, and regards it as a later creation. Conversely, it asserts that what actually came later came first. That's the source of the mistake these people have made about the real nature of the gods. Pliny says, so far the point escapes me. The Athenian says, it's the soul, my good friend, that nearly everybody seems to have misunderstood, not realizing its nature and power. Quite apart from the other points about it, people are particularly ignorant about its birth. It is one of the first creations, born long before all physical things and is the chief cause of all their alterations and transformations. Now, if that's true, anything closely related to the soul will necessarily have been created before material things, won't it? Since the soul itself is older than matter? Pliny says necessarily. The Athenian says, Opinion, diligence, reason, art, and law will be prior to roughness and smoothness, heaviness and lightness. In particular, the grand and primary works and creations, precisely because they come in the category primary, will be attributable to art natural things and nature herself, to use a mistaken terminology of our opponents, will be secondary products from art and reason. Clinia says, why do you say mistaken? The Athenian says, when they use the term nature, they mean the process by which the primary substances were created. But if it can be shown that soul came first, not fire or air, and that it was one of the first things to be created, it will be quite correct to say that soul is preeminently natural. This is true, provided you can demonstrate that soul is older than matter, but not otherwise. So I wanted to start with that and, you know, to get the sense of where they're going with the idea of soul and also with the idea of, uh, you know, kind of what is divine, what came first in the universe. And so this is a very different um, conception, I think, than, you know, maybe where modern science is taking things. 
Uh, but it's one that uh, Plato has presented elsewhere in the Philebus, for example. He said that the universe itself has a soul. Um, so this sort of thing is not perhaps subject to empirical evidence, and this causes some problems, I think. Um, but I wonder where we want to go with this. Any thoughts on this particular section that I just read? Steve. Welcome, uh, happy new year once, and uh, thank you again, James, for doing this and uh, for another year. And, thank you. Uh, my New Year's resolution, one of my New Year's resolutions is to be brief with my comments. So Thank let me you. start working on that. Um, from your opening statements, the part you read about the uh, things to keep in mind about the universe being spherical, the soul and things like that. You Right after that, you say, if you don't agree, if you disagree that there are alternatives and how would they work to set the universe in motion. So since you've laid down the gauntlet on that account, um, mm -hmm like to pick it up i'd like to uh, uh paraphrase uh darren what i think what i recall him saying twice uh during the timaeus uh, discussions uh last year and uh please correct me if i'm wrong but i got that plato's dialogues are mostly about metaphysics uh not cosmology and creation myth and uh the, the problem i i see with that is that now we're discussing laws and uh the other uh, dialogues, we're making the assumption, we have to make the assumption in order for this, uh, to have this discussion that the cosmology myth, creation myth, uh, God, God, soul, spherical shape of the universe has already been proven. Uh, however, Plato's cosmological view has been refuted as you, as you noted by modern science. A literal reading of Plato's cosmology creation myth is a story of Intelligent design, no different in my mind to the intelligent design that you get out of a literal reading of the Bible. The Bible has, you know, the creation, God creating the earth in seven days, you know, the mythologies of ancient Greeks and the Timaeus uh, has a different story, but it's definitely uh, the idea that there's a intelligence or uh, design, there's an intelligence uh, prime mover. And it implies that God's fingers touched or created to humans, as in that uh, painting you were showing of, of Michelangelo. And uh, the erroneous, and I won't say geocentric paradigm, because I've had a discussion with James on that, uh, but I'll we'll say the non-solar uh, centered, uh, where the astrology is more about the, it's more like a astrology where the zodiacs and the gods are the myths of the gods and the planets. And um, also my view would be that the uh, intelligence did not precede life. The theory of evolution shows that intelligence is a biological adaption of primates, that it's something that, um, you know, that primates developed. And we, we took it a little further when we, we had to leave the trees and go out in the savannas and you know, we didn't we didn't have the skills of the other animals that were living on the savanna, so we had to, you know, as might have been a uh, jump start for our intelligence, just a uh, what if. So uh, basically, belief in the gods don't guarantee moral behavior. Order and beauty of the universe does not imply divine. the The fact that there is order and beauty in the universe does not imply divine intelligence. The testimonial of the agents or the myths are not necessarily reliable. Natural attraction between the human and the divine is not proof of the exist of their existence. And uh, moral law is not necessarily uh, best considered as a divine command. Thank you. And thank you. And I think as you've expressed that, you're certainly not alone in that expression. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that hold that view. Um, and certainly things like intelligent design are very controversial now, but I, I'm not sure that science has refuted what Plato says about the uh, origin of the universe. I, I think it, it hasn't produced any evidence of it, but I, you know, I'd like to think that some science is maybe open to some of these ideas. Certainly the idea of a spherical universe is not necessarily refuted. In fact, I've recently read other references to that. So uh, I think some of it maybe um, is can stand uh, the test of of modern science, but certainly uh, what Plato says here is controversial. 
I think we'll see though, um, and I'd like to, and this is where I want to spend a good chunk of time today is on the, the last section in my notes, which is uh, the, the reading from 893C to 896E. That's where the Athenian presents the logic that, that lays out the case for the soul being the first thing to come into existence, not the second thing. Uh, so when you said intelligence is a biological adaptation, uh, that is at odds with that. So let, let's take a look at this logic at the uh, in that last reading and really consider whether there's some merit in it or whether there's some holes in it. Uh, but thank you for presenting the, the, the case. I think these are the issues that are going to be key. So thank you. Any other thoughts on, on this opening selection? I can go on to read this this next selection here. This is from 887A to 888B. And this is a question, you know, maybe as Steve expressed uh, some disbelief in the idea that the soul came first. Uh, this is a question that, and, and here the, the Athenian is acknowledging that this kind of opinion is certainly, you know, common and present in every society. And, and there's also people who believe in gods. Or, or God. Uh, and there's a lot of dispute about that. And a lot of people clearly hold both views today. So the question is, as you're making laws, how do you find some sort of common ground between the believers and the, non -be and the non believers? And I think that's where at the beginning of the laws and book one, as we'll see in four weeks, they talk about the idea of reconciling people. And so we have to deal with both belief and non-belief, and how do we do that? So uh, here's the Athenian at 887a, starting with this discussion. He says, what now then? What's our reply? What must we do? It's as though we were on trial before a bench of godless judges, defending ourselves on a charge arising out of our legislation. It's monstrous, they say to us, that you should pass laws asserting that gods exist. Shall we defend ourselves? Or shall we ignore them and get back to our legislation? so that the mere preface doesn't turn out longer than the actual code. I'll just break there briefly because we'll see in book three, I think it is, where they say that each law should be prefaced with a rather long explanation of the reason for the law. Um, so that's that reference there to preface. He goes on, you, you see, if we're going to postpone passing the appropriate legislation until we've proved properly to those with a taste for impiety, all the points they insisted we had to cover so that they feel uneasy and begin to find their views going sour on them, our explanation will be anything but brief. Cleanius says, even so, sir, as we've often said in the comparatively short time we've been talking, there's no reason at the moment to prefer a brief explanation to a full one. After all, no one's breathing down our neck, as they say. It would be an awful farce if we appeared to be putting brevity first and quality second. It's vital that somehow or other we should make out a plausible case for supporting that gods do exist, that they are good, and that they respect justice more than men do. Such a demonstration would constitute just about the best and finest preamble our penal code could have. So let's overcome our reluctance and unhurriedly exert what powers of persuasion we have in this field, devoting ourselves wholeheartedly to a full exposition of our case. The Athenian says, how keen and insistent you are. I take it you're suggesting we should now offer up a prayer for the success of our exposition, which we certainly can't delay any longer. Well, no, how can one argue for the existence of gods without getting angry? You see, one inevitably gets irritable and annoyed with these people who have put us to the trouble and continue to put us to the trouble of composing these explanations. If only they believed the stories which they had as babes and sucklings from their nurses and mothers. These almost literally charming stories were told partly for amusement, partly in full earnest. The children heard them related in prayer at sacrifices and saw acted representations of them, a part of the ceremony a child always loves to see and hear. And they saw their own parents praying with the utmost seriousness for themselves and their families and the firm conviction that their prayers and supplications were addressed to gods who really did exist. At the rising and setting of the sun and moon, the children saw and heard Greeks and foreigners, in happiness and misery alike, all prostrate in their devotions. Far from supposing gods to be a myth, the worshippers believed their existence to be so sure as to be beyond suspicion. When some people contemptuously brush aside all this evidence without a single good reason to support them, as even a halfwit can see, and oblige us to deliver this address, well, how could one possibly admonish them and at the same time teach them the basic fact about gods, their existence without using the rough edge of one's tongue? Still, we must make the best of it. We don't want both sides maddened at once. They, by their greed for pleasure, 
we by our anger at their condition. So our address to men with such depraved outlook should be calm and run as follows. Let's use honeyed words and abate our anger and pretend we're addressing just one representative individual. So here's the proposal of a believer as to how to address the the non-believers. And he, he says, let's use honeyed words and abate our anger. So don't, don't debate in anger. Uh, debate from maybe reason. And I think here we are seeing some maybe relationship to some of the discussion that goes on now in the making of laws. There are those who believe that the law should reflect certain religious principles, uh, and they won't tolerate any discussion otherwise. And there are those who believe that there's no place for any sort of religious principles in the laws. And the question is, how do we broker some sort of harmony between these two different sides? Any thoughts, Michael? Hello, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm new to the group. So thanks Welcome. for letting me join in the conversation. Hmm. And what I'm really struck by, particularly in book 10, but especially this passage is there's actually a sense in which uh, Plato has his characters embodying maybe a threefold dialogue. So Plato is describing these myths that people were raised on, but what he's describing there, you might think of as pre-reflective religion. And he's contrasting that with skeptics. And there were materialists in Plato's day who thought the pre-reflective religion didn't correspond to anything real. And what sort of seems to me to be happening in the rest of book 10, the discussion that follows right after this, where we're going to have a persuasive case being made, is something that says, well, maybe there's some truth to each. Maybe there is some truth to the skepticism that, for example, this picture of the gods as constantly being at war with each other and reflecting the worst impulses of humanity, maybe that's not a true picture. But that doesn't mean there isn't a true picture whatsoever. And so I actually kind of think of this as a threefold that you've got the pre pre reflective believers and the reflective unbelievers. And I think uh, Plato's characters are trying to make space for a third category, which you might call the reflective believers who are going to make a case for this picture of the gods who are a kind of ideal. There's a lot of um, interweaving between the norms and values of a just society and the picture of the gods as they're being represented in the stories that um, the Athenian thinks we should be telling. So I, I just want to kind of throw that out to the group as maybe the way that this um, contrast between these two groups is being brokered. Well, thank you. And that's, um, so I, I think the, the three internal dialogues, I guess, that you were talking about, if I understood them correctly, is the pre-reflective believers, the reflective unbelievers, and the reflective believers. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, let, let's pursue that, because maybe that, that is the, the three groups that need to be spoken uh, to, or, or, or need to be harmonized, I guess, in, in terms of why this concept of God, as they're going to define it, it's not necessarily how we think of God, but they're, they're going to define it in this dialogue as something that's important to the laws. So um, I guess, yes, we do need to ar arrive at some accommodation for all three of those of those groups. So thank you for that. Um, so I have DLJ, then Steve, then Darren. DLJ, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, yeah, Michael just articulated my thought better than I was thinking it. So well done for that. Thank you. Um, so what else to say? Um, you said, how do you broker between the different... I was th my first thought was purges, but that's not quite what we're after, is it? Um, democracy, interesting enough. Um, Plato was not a fan, was he? But oddly enough, that is the solution that we've come up with, generally speaking, across the planet, not everybody, um, in order to accommodate the various views. In other words, if the, if the majority are all believing something ridiculous, flat earth or whatever, but if it's the majority, then so be it. They get to base their laws on such a thing, right? Um, the scientific bent that we, we've been on as well, um, moving away from gods, 
has generally given us the idea that anything, gods or otherwise, uh, anything that is unfalsifiable or undemonstrable as a hypothesis is not something we should be basing policy on, um, which is generally accepted, uh, except for people's favourite thing that they believe in, of course. And that's where obviously democracy comes in. Uh, but yeah, I think Michael said it better than I did. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I like the way you... Um... You ended that there. So the yeah, the, the, this question of democracy definitely is something that Plato and his characters have trouble with. And there's actually a part of this reading today, it's later on, where the Athenian talks about men making laws that seem to just suit one particular time, and they don't necessarily reflect all time. And I think that's maybe one of the issues. People get these strong beliefs, and then they get into some sort of majority position and then they impose these beliefs in the laws and the laws are enacted and they're they're strong and they're unbreakable, but it doesn't leave that room for reconciliation, which I think is what um, what really the aim of, of one of the key aims of this dialogue is to how do we reconcile these different views? So thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to Steve and then Darren. Yes, I agree with the prior two views, very, very well said. Uh, th my reading through th through this is that most of the discussion is about you know not whether to impose laws about uh, the gods worship. It's definitely they're they're all on the same page about yes it's something you know the discussions that's something they should do uh, whether it should be up to including death. You know part of what the discussion is is like well we have some time let's uh, let's try and uh, convince these. The people that are on the wrong track, like the atheists or the materialists, are 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 put as immature children that you know haven't experienced enough of life, and eventually they you know once they once they get a taste of the real world, they'll understand. Then there's the class of people that think that the gods are you know don't necessarily care about us. It's like they're not interested in what we do. They were programmers that created a video game and then got tired of it and just they're not paying attention to it. And there's one other group that they mentioned. But the idea is, you know, from the historical standpoint now, it's like the idea that there should be any laws uh, regarding what a person believes in. You know, I don't I don't really care whether a person has a belief in gods, which type of religion, what type of gods, you know, it's the the idea that. This type of, I think the general, the biggest discussion is whether there should be laws to this type or not. I mean, most of the questions that, that, that James has are, are relating to their arguments to convince that Plato's views are the correct views. But I don't really think that's the, the big issue is whether there should be any laws of this kind at all. And, uh, you know, I think that throughout history, we've seen all the religious wars and how many people have been killed because of it. I think it's potentially the idea to have a strong constitution that allows, you know, complete religious philosophical beliefs. You know, we've had the discussions about the the positives and negatives on a strong constitution. Uh, but that's those are my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. And thanks, because in the next section that I'll read, it, it talks about those three different beliefs about the gods that people have. And so this is this issue with reconciling those. And maybe there's a fourth type of belief that's appropriate. And I think the fourth type of belief is maybe what's being suggested here. Now, whether these are Plato's personal views or not, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think his personal view, which comes through clearly in, in many dialogues, is that the universe itself has a soul. Now, the question is, how do we define God, right? So we have in, you know, I think current religious context, the sense that God is some supernatural being who resides maybe somewhere in the sky and has command over all that is, has command over us as well as uh, all, all physical matter and some sort of all-encompassing knowledge. So, you know, maybe... I don't know whether that means God is the universe. Like, what's the difference between universe and God? I, I don't know. So maybe this conception that we need to we need to define what Plato is talking about in this in terms of God here. I think I think it really does relate to soul, right? So the universal soul, and and so each each of us has a soul. So does that mean that each of us is part of God? 
Uh, and I think maybe that's what I see as a very empowering vision here, um, is that God is not above us. We are part of God and God is part of us. And that's because the very first thing that came into being in the universe was the soul. Uh, so I think that this, this question of definition is important. And several times in this section, they talk about the importance of uh, names and definitions. And if you name something like God, you have to be able to define it. But then if you give the definition, you have to be able to track the definition back to the name. And this is something that's very reminiscent of the Cradleus, I think, in which we did um, at the beginning of last season. And I think this is important. So when we talk about gods, we should really understand what's being talked about, I think. So, uh, and, and maybe just set aside any current notions of what God is and, and really see what the words are saying here. So, but, but thank you for, you know, calling that into question. I think it's very important. And so we'll go to Darren. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be back for the first meeting of 2024 for Plato's well, Pod. <laughs> welcome back. I guess we'll be at this for a while, given the length of this uh, dialogue. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to it, though. So thank you for the opportunity, James. Um, and I'll just I just have a bunch of comments just based off of um, what we've read so far from the passages and um, also other people's comments. I, I want to preface, though, by saying I haven't read any of the rest of the laws. I, I've only read what was in book 10. I, I read all of book 10. So and that's it. So there's maybe some context, maybe I, I don't understand. And I'm even hesitant to even say much of anything because I understand how important context is for reading Plato um, and character and setting and drama and all that. So I always like bring, I like to bring that into interpretation. I don't feel like I can really do that today, but, but um, regardless here, 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 here are just some of my thoughts of I have so far. Um, so regarding this passage that we just read. So when he says, if, when the Athenian says, if only they believed the stories which they had as babes and sucklings from their nurses and mothers, exclamation mark, and then he goes on to describe that and sort of the the culture surrounding religion. I, I actually thought he was being ironic. You know, my, I think maybe Michael might have corrected my impression, but I actually thought like this whole section was just ironic because like he says, if only like it's, it's also the way it's put, although I mean, I understand the translation, but you know, presumably it's it, it captures the spirit of the original. It's also the way it's put. If only they believe the stories which they had as babes and sucklings from their nurses and mothers. I mean, the stories which we tell babes and sucklings from their nurses and mothers. I mean, I like, I don't know. Maybe there's is there maybe there's a cultural distance here, but I'm I'm not sure. Like we're supposed to put too much um, uh, credence in those things. But I don't know. So I, I'm just like this was my observation. I thought he, I thought the whole section was being ironic, which might affect how you might interpret what's coming up next. Okay. So regarding this issue of um, reconciling people as um, part of the mission of the laws, or, or at least um, in creating this colony, and um, the importance of justification, I'm very much looking forward to reading more about this. I I understand from James and other conversation we had that it's coming up in uh, book one. Uh, I'm very excited to read this. It sounds like an interesting like philosophy of law, and uh, I'll be interested in where Plato goes goes with that. And it would have implications for you know our world today too. So first of all, I guess um, one thing that's sort of um, interesting to me. This also comes up later uh, when he says, "When the most important laws are being trampled underfoot by scoundrels, whose duty is it to rush to their defense if not the legislators?" So. I guess it's a little bit interesting, right, that the legislator here isn't just, you know, in some, you know, ivory tower or whatever tower, <laughs> um, just, you know, coming up with what they think are the best laws and just saying, OK, here are the laws. Everyone must follow them. You know, it's just sort of decreeing things. But, you know, it's they, they sort of have to defend them to people. So that that's I don't know if we've I guess we might have seen in other places and those laws i don't i don't know if this necessarily comes to republic although someone corrected mm. that but that's a little bit interesting but I, i'm looking forward to reading more about this though the thing about justification though is that i mean i have so many questions like what if it fails like what if people aren't convinced because i'm not clear like the arguments are coming up regarding proving the god or god exists and you know the soul has priority in you know the the order of the universe i'm not sure that's going to be convincing to everyone yeah i mean in fact i'm quite confident it wouldn't be because of what we know the diversity range of positions on this today even amongst you know thinking people you know philosophers and intelligent people there's a huge variety of opinions about this i mean okay so the legislature provides a justification but what if it doesn't go anywhere what if it fails then what like i'll be interested to 
see what he says about that, if anything, in the rest of this dialogue. But an interesting thing about justification for me, though, is that it actually means that whatever they conclude in this dialogue isn't necessarily definitive because justifications like can fail and you might change your justification because a justification is, a, is, is almost like a relationship, right? Like you have to understand who you're talking to in order to justify things to them. You know, this is, I guess, what Aristotle discussed in rhetoric. Yeah, you know, you have to know your audience. It's not just sitting in your, you know, in your bedroom doing metaphysics on your own and trying to figure out the truth on your own. You're actually trying to justify things to, you know, to people. So it actually leaves a kind of opening for debate and change. You know, if the justification changes or if people come up with something else or change their mind, then that leaves an opening for the laws to change. So I think that might be kind of interesting. Although I, I am troubled, though, that it seems like after they try to engage in this justification, they sort of at the end of this book, they just sort of come out with these punishments <laughs> about like, you know, death penalty for the bad atheists that, you know, five years of solitary confinement for the, for the good atheists. It, like, like there's justification, but clearly if there's atheists exist to be punished, then the justification hasn't worked. Then what's the point of justification if you're going to, if you're going to punish them anyway? So I don't know. There's like, there's, just, there's like weird stuff going on here. So I'll be interested in, you know, in, as we go forward to finding out more about how this, how this works in this book. I, I have another thought about, I'll, I'll save it for later. I'll probably come up later. So I don't know long okay. enough. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and you touched on so many great things or uh, points. And, and certainly that justification and the punishment is something that we will have to confront in our next session in two weeks uh, as we look at the second half of book 10. So I think that's very important. It, interestingly, you touched on the idea of having to defend the laws to the people and what happens over time if the defenses fail. There's a very intricate system of offices and officers that Plato sets up in the laws. Um, and this system is meant to be kind of self-regulating. So it, it, it contains many positions, uh, you know, for the guardians of the laws, scrutineers who make sure that things are happening according to principles, many different positions. So there's many different authorities in this system. And it, it's meant to be, maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit of a system of checks and balances this is the way that the the people can ensure that the government is good and in cultivating virtue, which I think is the key thing in this, that the constitution has to cultivate virtue. It can't just let anybody do whatever they want. There has to be some cultivation of virtue. And this is maybe not something that's commonly looked at in constitutions now, or at least the way they've evolved over time. But um, I think this is something that we really have to think about here. Um, the part that you started with, uh, mentioning that those words, if only they believe these stories, I guess this is just, you know, it, the Athenian was saying that because he's taking the position of a believer. And he's saying, gee, it would be nice if these non-believers just simply were, would believe what they were told and don't ask questions. He's not being dismissive. I think he's just taking the position of a believer. And he's saying, well, okay, we need to talk to these people. Uh, it's not going to be easy because he says it, it's, you know, it's it's going to be frustrating but we have to talk to them and we have to use not the rough edge of the tongue, but honeyed words to talk to them. So, you know, he, he clearly has strong views, but, you know, he's, he's trying to be good about it. And so then if he's trying to reconcile, then we have to see the non-believers reconciling with the believers. So maybe this is the next section that we'll, that we'll see here. So thanks for uh, bringing all of that, uh, all of that onto the table. And we'll go to Michael. James, I'd like to make a comment um, somewhat building on the questions Darren raised, but I intend this to be a comment that will be a nice lead in to you reading the next section you have in your notes. So I intend this to be a kind of bridge. But what I what I was sort of thinking as Darren, you were talking is I think we need to sort of hold in mind what Plato is really up to here, which is He's trying to deal with this problem of what happens when a society disintegrates because we can't build a common system of values. And I actually think the problem he's dealing with, although it's couched in this religious language, is actually a problem that any political society deals with. So when you raise the problem that we'll deal with in our next recording about, um, you know, there's this 
process of persuasion. But if that doesn't work, we've got punishments at the end to deal with people. I was sort of thinking uh, as a as an American, you know, what's been going on in my country with um, the consternation around our system of democracy. So as many of you know, um, a few years ago, we had a riot in our nation's capital. And you could sort of think of up to that point, there had been a process of persuasion of trying to get people to buy into the electoral system, to buy into the system of government. And that process didn't work. And so now we've been going through as a country, a system of of trials, uh, literal judicial trials and punishments being meted out. Now they're not maybe to the extremity of the type of punishments that is being described in our text. But I think um, nonetheless, it's showing a sort of parallel problem that no matter what type of society you build, you can't have a structured society unless there's something in common. And I think what's really interesting about what Plato's doing here, and I think which is going to come up in the next passage James has in the notes, is that unlike us today, where we've largely privatized notions of the good, he's sort of being a little more ambitious and saying, rather than pretending that we can get by with this really bare minimum of values that we hold in common, what if we said, hey, beliefs about religion and so forth are actually going to be part of what divides us, what creates conflicts. What if we just bring that right into the foreground and we have a rational discussion about that, figure out what types of values should organize our society. And then, yeah, if there are still, if there's still dissent, we're going to have to have a compulsory system to bring whoever still um, not in line into line. Whether or not we think that's a good way to do things, um, when I look at what's happening in my country, I still think we're doing something like that in our societies even today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that sort of amplifies what I was trying to say in the introduction in terms about how I see so many things in this dialogue talking about things that are happening now and, and this need, this problem we have with reconciling now there's polarization instead of reconciliation. And this is maybe because the art of persuasion has disappeared and we're not able to find this common ground. So uh, I think you touched on, you know, really an important point in terms of the good, you know, so what's, and, and we'll see in the reading, you know, what's good in nature in the universe should be good in the laws as well. We see the two different types of good right now, which is, a, which is he's saying is a problem. Um, and, you know, again, I think here, I mean, personally, my own views about this dialogue are still evolving, but I'm kind of seeing us as standing maybe in judgment of what the Athenian, uh, Clinius and Megillus are, are doing uh, or are saying. Um, so I don't think we're meant to conclude necessarily that what they say is correct, I think we need to stand in judgment and use our own sense of reason. Um, so, you know, for me, the jury's still out on what they're saying, but I think some of the basic principles make sense. And certainly the idea of finding some sort of common ground is especially important today. So um, I appreciate that. And we'll go to Steve. Just a couple of quick points of order on what Michael said. Um, I live in the United States all and the attack on January 6th was not the first time. It's actually the second time. You have to count the Civil War, too, as a uh, as a representation of a split there. And the punishments that are being meted out are, are the trials and punishment are based on, you know, people breaking statutory laws. They're not based. They're not like a, a, uh, a dictatorship that's that are, are, are prosecuting people because they 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 voted for the loser of the election. So I just want to make those two points of order and, um, you know, go forward from there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. And, and I actually saw the word civil war in a headline this morning. I can't remember whether it was the Washington Post or the New York Times. It's not the first time I've seen that term used in, in the modern political context in, in the debate that's going, that's raging now. So uh, maybe this is something that's returning to the, uh, unfortunately, 
but anyway, um, so thank you. And uh, we'll go to Brenda. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, something that I think is crucially different in our modern times as compared to the times that Plato lived in. So Plato lived in a polytheistic society and nobody at that time ever went to war over their gods. Their attitude was the more gods, the better. They accepted gods from other cultures happily. But ever since the rise of monotheism, with Christianity and Islam, wars are very often, they very often occur in the name of religion. So when he's looking to believing in gods or having an opinion about the gods and the gods relationship to the existence of soul, he's really looking at this without a thought in his mind that the notion of God could ever make people go to war. He doesn't, that thought I'm sure never crossed his mind. Whereas in our modern times, it has become a real problem. Thank you, Brenda. That really made me think about a really significant difference maybe now or, or change now. And, you know, to the extent that we think that there's one God and the God I believe in is different from the God you believe in, then it leads not only to disputes, but as you say, to wars. And there are wars raging still about this question. And it, it's, it's unfortunate. Why would people war about the nature of the universe? Um it's anyway, it's, I mean, this is, I think, how we have to find some sort of common understanding. And I don't know, I, I'm hopeful that we'll find something in this dialogue that will be helpful in that. But I thank you for really setting that context because I think that is a, a major difference now where we have this take or to leave it sort of belief, you know, my God or no God, you know, this, this kind of. So, you know, and again, we have to think here how is Plato talking about God? The name God, how is that defined? It's defined differently from the way we maybe normally define it now. And this is something that I I wanted, this is, it leads into this reading here at 889E that I wanted to do now, um, which really gets us into the question, what is God? When Plato talks about God, what is God? So this is from 889E to 890C. The Athenian starts... My dear fellow, the first thing these people say about the gods is that they are artificial concepts corresponding to nothing in nature. They are legal fictions, which, moreover, vary very widely according to the different conventions people agree on when they produce a legal code. In particular, goodness according to nature and goodness according to the law are two different things, and there is no natural standard of justice at all. On the contrary, men are always wrangling about their moral standards and altering them and every change introduced becomes binding from the moment it's made, regardless of the fact that it is entirely artificial and based on convention, not nature in the slightest degree. All this, my friends, is the theme of experts, as our young people regard them, who, in their prose and poetry, maintain that anything one can get away with by force is absolutely justified. This is why we experience outbreaks of impiety among the young, who assume that the kind of gods the law tells them to believe in do not exist. This is why we get treasonable efforts to convert people to the true natural life, which is essentially nothing but a life of conquest over others, not one of service to your neighbor as the law enjoins. Linnea says, what a pernicious doctrine you've explained, sir. It must be the ruin of the younger generation, both in the state at large and in private families. That's very true, Clinius. So what do you think the legislator ought to do, faced with such a long-established thesis as this? Is he simply to stand up in public and threaten all the citizens with punishment if they don't admit the existence of gods and mentally accept the law's description of them? He could make the same threat about their notions of beauty and justice and all such vital concepts, as well as about anything that encourages virtue or vice. He could demand that the citizens' belief and actions should accord with his written instructions and insist that anyone not showing the proper obedience to the laws must be punished either by death or by a whipping and imprisonment, deprivation of civic rights, or being sent into exile, a poorer man. But what about persuading them? When he establishes a legal code for his people, should they try to talk them into being as amenable as he can make them? So I wanted to highlight that section for a number of different reasons. First of all, it gets us, you know, thinking about the nature of God, you know, and, and this this idea that God is not an unnatural thing. God is natural. And God has a relationship to soul. 
Um, but I think there's another another very important part of this, which is, uh, you know, the question: How do you think? What do you think the legislator ought to do faced with such long established thesis? Do we threaten? Do we punish? What are we to do? You know, it, he's raising the question of, you know, does this require a tyrant? You know, because tyrants take some of these measures, right? Tyrants demand that citizens' belief and action should accord with his written instructions, and that anyone not showing the proper obedience to the laws must be punished either by death or by a whipping. I, I read, actually, this morning, uh, it was in The Guardian, they, they had a, a video of some teenagers in North Korea who were apparently punished to 12 years hard labor for playing South Korean music. You know, this is what happens when these absolute these absolutists get into power. Um, and the question is, what should the legislator do? So the conclusion coming out here anyway is that that they should try to persuade. But then, you know, we have this issue in we'll see in two weeks where, you know, persuasion fails and then they resort to the death penalty. So I don't know where we're going with this, but uh, I just wanted to point this out that at least they're raising the, the point here. Like, is it like persuasion is the first thing that we should try in any event? We don't we don't want to resort to these punishments immediately. So, Elena, your thoughts? Yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me? OK. Yes. All right. Yeah, so I have some resistance in interpreting this particular section in this passage. For one, there is that slippery slope and the tendency to flip from if you bootstrap rhetoric or persuasion around the gods or God in support of legislation then you have this um, move towards a more authoritative or totalitarian position um, and things can get uh, very volatile and lead to violence at that point um, as we've seen in the past, in the more recent past. And I guess I should specify particularly in the 20th century, but we, we have to be weary of that uh, possibility now, I feel as well. So I guess that is a key point. I'm trying to think of what minor point also came to mind. Um, yeah, but the rhetorical move to kind of um, leverage an appeal to the gods in order to reinforce legislation is definitely problematic, at least from the position of today, from, from the position of uh, my interpretation of history, as we've seen that happen before where it's led. So um, I'm not sure how much of that Plato himself has seen as problematic. He, he very well may have and is sort of egging us on to consider the problem of the authority when um, there's a rhetorical type of corruption for what may seem to many believers as a reinforcement in their appeal to the gods and how it silences a democratic process, the power that it has. Because mm -hmm. I feel a lot of the tension and the tendency here is, of course, the unsaid word around what's going on with power. So there is that aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, I think I'll pretty much stop right there and think about it some more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I think you really put your finger on a very important issue in question here that we should think about throughout our discussion on the laws, which is, what is the art of persuasion? And so I guess, you know, I'm thinking there's, you know, a couple types. There's persuasion through reason, which I think Plato would, you know, that, that would be his form of persuasion. Uh, but then there's also persuasion by deception. And that, I think, is what we are facing now in terms of some of the technological challenges, in particular with the political discourse worldwide. And there is persuasion going on now for sure, but is it reasoned persuasion? And I think that's that's something that we need to be very careful about. So yeah, definitely, and as you said, history points out the issues when a particularly 
persuasive person who isn't necessarily telling the truth, a sophist, perhaps, well-spoken sophist, and we've seen such people in Plato's dialogues, like Protagoras, for example, uh, you know, if such a sophist were to uh, try to deceive us, they could go a long distance in deceiving us. So we have to be very careful about that. So thank you, you know, for pointing out that problem with with history and the issues. I, I would say, you know, there's a couple of things we want to think about there. Um, we want to think about, uh, you know, persuasion involves opinion. And opinion is one of the parts of the divided line of knowledge, which is part of Plato's cosmology. So we want to keep in mind the divided line of, of knowledge from the Republic and how we go from opinion to actual knowledge and how we go then from actual knowledge to wisdom, which is right to the end of the divided line of knowledge. Uh, and then again, I would I would say we have here in this dialogue, and we'll see, we, we're not going to see it in this discussion today, but we'll see as we go you know, into book one and subsequent books, that there are all of these offices that are being established, uh, all of these positions that are being established to kind of act as checks and balances, maybe against that sort of rogue persuader. So it's interesting, but we'll see if it's if it's workable. I, I don't know if it's workable. So thank you for raising that. And we'll go to Steve and then Darren. Yeah, I agree with that, Ellen, a lot, very much the, uh, you know, the, the bigger question I think here is, why should there be any laws, you know, about making or not, you know, how people have to believe in God, God's uh, soul or Plato's pet world soul or any of the things that he puts forward or any of the, you know, other beliefs that, that other people have, you know, that this is a, a very fraught area to have any sort of laws. And the idea that, you know, I think the discussion as far as that the, we need to have laws and what, what do we want laws to do is a very good discussion, you know, and what are the purpose of laws for a society, which is, that's a very positive discussion. But I think that, you know, all this talk about, you know, proving that there's gods or, you know, having different versions of the soul or the universal or animism, that buddies the whole water. It distracts from the idea there shouldn't be any sort of rules of that nature, in my view. Earlier on, they talked about the uh, young people, or, you know, I guess they were the materialists or the atheists, uh, you know, saying that, you know, because they don't believe in the gods, they're going to do whatever they want. Well, that's that's a straw man. You know, that's not necessarily true. There's a lot of people that don't believe in in um, gods or soul or world soul, and, and they, don't, they don't think it's right to hurt other people or to steal from other people. So that's a straw man. So I just think the bigger question is here is, why is the focus on laws about gods? Uh, why is Plato focusing on that? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I, I think it's, it's something that we absolutely have to keep in mind and be able to answer, hopefully by the time we get to the end of this dialogue. As I said at the outset, I think it's because this project involves a change in thinking so that the laws will uh, help to instill a sense of virtue. And this is why understanding understanding Plato's cosmology, that the soul is the first thing that came into existence, that's where virtue exists, is in the soul. And then he asked in, in the part that I read earlier, if there's a universal concept of justice, and justice, you know, again, was the subject of the Republic, uh, as they were trying to make a, a city in that dialogue. And Socrates said the next day at the Timaeus, he didn't actually really believe that what they did would be actually, that it could actually be set into motion. And we're talking here about motions. Like these, these are actually motions in the colony that are going to be set up. So I think this is the issue that we need to deal with. And it's something that we'll have to come to grips with. Why should there be this focus on laws relating to the soul, essentially, uh, or, or to how they define God? And so I would ask, and I'll ask when we get to this part in the next section of the reading, what difference would it make to our existence today if it could be proven by science that the soul was the first thing that came into existence? I'll put that question on the table. I don't think we'll get an answer today, but I want, I'll put it repeatedly. I, I want an answer to that. I really want people's impressions as to what, what difference it would make if, if it could be scientifically proven that the soul came into being first. So thank you for raising that question. Uh, and we'll go to Darren, then Michael, and then Clem. I have a bunch of comments, again, just related to things that were just said. So Steve, Alan, and also Brenda, actually. Um, 
But first, um, so what Steve just said about, he said something about it being a straw man that like one can't be good without uh, believing in gods. So actually Plato does seem to think we can't be good <laughs> without uh, believing in God. At least it's possible, maybe not everyone, but like, because at the end of this book, he meets out punishments for atheists and there are bad atheists and there there's the atheists who are at least just or <laughs> or you know have a sense of justice or something along those lines so and though they only get five years of like basically solitary confinement and then the bad atheists who don't believe in god and aren't just uh you know they get killed right away they get capital punishment um like just that division you know tells us it is possible to be good without believing in gods and what's the point of like the gods part then one might ask so that's an open question that you know, other people have brought up in in other variations already um responding to alan he says something about it being um problematic to use god or religion you know to you know justify um your laws and what is good what people should do like just tying it back with what i said um in my first comment I think it's actually less, a little bit less problematic in that this is this whole, it seems like the dialogue is framed in terms of these justifications for these laws. Um, you know, these, again, these aren't just people like just sort of deciding, you know, in their, in, in some cloistered, you know, position where, you know, they just decide what's good and then just dictate it. You know, it, the, the fact that it is a matter of justification and, it, and it's actually in the laws and they actually say in this, in, in a reading today that, um, or, or at least in book 10, that, you know, people can actually go and read it themselves. You know, it's going to be very long, but, you know, it's actually good that it's written down because people can go back over and over and, and study these justifications. So the fact that it's a justification might might make it a little bit less problematic. I'm not saying this, you know, Alan would be satisfied with, you know, such a this aspect, but um, or the justification. But at least I think it, it lessens the concern a little bit because I, I think that makes it a bit more um, malleable. And also... It's not always terrible to use religion or use God to justify certain things if it's couched in terms of justification, because your audience might be receptive to those arguments. You have to know who your audience is when you justify things. So there might be a certain audience in mind for what's being described here. So it probably won't work, won't work as justification today, but, you know, back in those days, maybe, you know, the atheism wasn't so, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's, it, it was a different character or maybe it wasn't, or maybe, um you know, the people were more receptive to religious ideas. So even if they were atheists um, for whatever reasons. So I, I think the fact that it's in terms of justification might help a little bit. I will say I'm also, I was very interested in what James said earlier about, you know, I forgot what exactly terms, but there were like other institutions surrounding justification it doesn't seem like we're just talking about like, you know, what James said, like the art of justification, but institutions surrounding justification, which I'm very interested in reading more about. So I'm looking forward to reading, finding out more about that, because I think that would be very helpful. Um, I mean, you might even see our democracy as one of the institutions of justification. We also have justification in courts and in the constitution, you know, that is interpreted by our highest core. You know, there's, there's justification everywhere. And democracy in terms of freedom of the speech, freedom of the press, and then, you know, people actually voting, you know, that all might be seen as institutions of justification. But I, I'm not sure exactly what play was getting into, but I think that might also help with some of the concerns. Okay, so I guess I've gone on <laughs> maybe a long time. So I'll just quickly make my last point regarding responding to Brenda. Um, and also, actually, another point that Steve brought up. So yeah, Brenda mentioned this really interesting thing about how Plato probably didn't have in mind, you know, people going to war over gods. And, and so like this also, I think this also ties to Steve's like question, like why is Plato focusing on, you know, laws about having the right beliefs about God? It's not even just about um, believing that God exists. Like they, you have to have belief specific things about the God, which is coming up in next week's reading. Like you can't be a deist, for instance. Um, why does Plato care about this then, especially given what Brenda said? And I like to me, I think it might not be that people's beliefs in God's leading them to war or, or conflict. But that like not believing in God is like seems to be tied in. And we, and we see this in the reading we just uh, James just did. It seems to be tied up with concern with people not believing in justice, basically, because like there is like what in the reading that uh, James did this, it says um, people who think there is no natural standard of justice at all. And they think that anything one can get away with by force is absolutely justified. And of course, we see in the Book of Republic, uh, Thrasymachus says that justice is whatever the powerful decides it is. So, you know, uh, um, so the concern is tied up with people not believing basically in 
justice or I think it comes back to not believing in the good. Like the problem of God here, I think it's tied in with not believing in this concept of the good, capitalized G, however you understand that. Um, like we see this here, right? Like, so here are some of the things uh, we just read. It says that we don't want both sides mad at once. They by their greed for pleasure, we by our anger at their condition. And it says the most important of all, however lightly you take it at the moment, is to get the right ideas about the God and so live a good life. Otherwise, you'll live a bad one. And then I, I would just one more thing is that so at the very beginning of the reading of book 10, they talk about how it's these in similar terms. So this is the atheist speaking. It's these in similar terms that we hear them, the God spoken of by the most highly thought of poets and orators and prophets and priests and thousands of other people, too. That's why most of us make little effort to avoid crime, but commit it first and try to put things right afterwards. So the same idea that you can get away with anything as long, you know, as by, by either force or cunning. And, you know, that, that is literally right. That, like that defines justice. Like that is the, what the standard justice is instead of this more eternal universal idea. So why this stuff about God? I think we see in the passage, we're just reading that it's tied in with the problem of the good, but I'll, I'll just shut up now. Sorry. <laughs> Well, no, and thanks. You, you touched on some interesting things there. It's the idea of institutionalizing the justification of the laws. I think is exactly what we're going to see uh, when we get into all these different offices that are being established. It's quite a matrix of these offices, uh, so that'll be interesting to look at. And and yeah, I like the way you said that maybe not believing in in God as it's defined here in relation to the soul leads to injustice and leads to a lack of virtue. And I think that's maybe the the key, the, the core of the issue. And that's maybe why we need to uh, look at these rules. So we'll go to Michael and then Clem. And then I do want to get to that last part of the reading, because this is really, that last part of the reading is the justification for the soul being the first thing to come into existence. And again, I want to go back to that question. What would we do differently if we knew that the soul was the first thing, the prime thing in nature? So Michael and then Clem. Yeah, I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I kind of just want to build on Darren's last comment as a way of doing some justice to Steve's question about, you know, if we're concerned with why, you know, what constitutes good lawmaking, why do we need to bring the gods into it in the first place? And I, I think Darren really touched on the key idea. It comes actually in that passage that James currently has on our screen that the end of that first paragraph of the Athenian, where he says, he makes this contrast between those who think the true natural life is a life of conquest over others. And that clause after that comma is what I think Plato wants us to sort of see as the alternative one of service to your neighbor as the law enjoins. So we're getting this contrast between might makes right versus a society built around the responsibility of each person to serve their neighbor. And um, these are little clues that I think Plato leaves around to knit together his project. And I think Darren was right to notice that this is connecting back to Thrasymachus and the Republic saying, you know, whoever's got the biggest army or the most guns or something like that gets to call the shots. That's the kind of life that Plato really recoils against. He's trying to build a world where power or strength is not what determines the concourse of society. And if we're wondering, what does God have to do with this? Well, Plato's conception of might makes right, it has it as an instance of this view that what is good or what is just is just whatever we think it is. And that's the view that he's against. So something we haven't read yet, but at some point I'm sure we'll get to in the podcast in, few, in the months to come is a comment he makes in book five, where he says, God is the measure of all things, as opposed to man or people being the measure of all things. And that's sort of Plato's way of, of talking about whether or not the values that knit together a society should be driven by personal preference or driven by a transcendental standard. And that's really what I think is wrapped up in all this. I don't think it really has to do primarily with who's got the right religion or something like that. 
it has to do with whether or not the values that structure a society are going to be values that humans have to respond to, or are they just the preferences that humans have? Because Plato's fear is if that's the case, then it's it's the right preferences are going to be whoever can get to together the biggest mob or the biggest army or something like that. Thank you. I, I love that term, transcendental standard. I, I'm going to try to remember that one because uh, I, I really think that's what they're looking for here is is and whether they're able to live up to that standard if as they're trying to define it is is going to be interesting. But transcendental standard is interesting and certainly remind us of the theme of the Theotetus is man the measure of all things. And this is the problem that Plato touches on with these words here, where he has the Athenians saying, men are always wrangling about their moral standards and altering them. And, you know, whoever happens to be, to, to be able to gain access to power through, you know, real persuasion or deceptive persuasion uh, is going to be able to set those standards and instantly enact them and impose them on everybody else. And there is where the reconciliation disappears. So, and that's where perhaps things like insurrections start to happen. So, so thank you for that. Um, and we'll go to Klim and then I'll do the reading. Hello everyone. It's good to be back uh, from last year's uh, Timaeus. Happy New Year, everybody. Okay. Um, so to build a little bit on what already has been said about the uh, I guess the transcendental standard and the the politics. Uh, we we know that Plato is. I mean, he is a metaphysician, but he, but then he's also a political metaphysician. <laughs> he's a political philosopher. So I'm going to consider. Right. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent convinced. But I'm going as an alternative, and maybe something to that could put a slightly different vector on this this discussion without denying everything that has been said. But has, has anybody considered that Plato may be potentially molding uh, his metaphysics and kind of re-engineering re or engineering metaphysics to achieve certain um, goal, the political goal? Um, because he's obviously looking for a strong foundation for the the social norms and to him i mean i'm i'm actually convinced that to him the um the, the social norms should come right from from the higher principles and then we we mentioned earlier we kind of touched on the the honeyed words uh you know expression and so he's he's trying to maybe like to maybe to sweeten the the pill for his opponents who are non-believers or not the, the right way believers right and he's considering himself to be maybe superior or his school to be a superior thinkers right and more maybe more enlightened than the people that he's trying to preach to so has anybody like i have this a uh, hint of doubt <laughs> Uh, that he may be, you know, like a true, in this particular case, that he may be, or in this dialogue, that he may be like a true metaphysician, a true, the, the somebody who is really looking for the truth, like how things are made at the universal level. How is the, like almost, because if you compare this to Timaeus, it's, he, he gives a slightly different account <laughs> uh, on the soul, on the constitution of soul, its origins and so on. And not that I'm necessarily like overly critical about that. I think it's good to to give different positions uh, of metaphysics, and uh, there, there's value in you know comparing different uh, different met met metaphysics and 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 thinking and kind of brainstorming right on how the universe uh, has come about, mm -hmm. but. I have this feeling that maybe he is just trying to get to the the like the final goal, the final product. Like he has, <laughs> he is on the deadline. He has like <laughs> he has to produce something that's that maybe with the minimum effort is going to 
um, convince the other party, right, that he's right. Because because if he gets if he gets to that goal, if he, if he achieves his objective, to him it's like oh, it's like half of the work has been done. We're we're almost there. Because number one, he's looking for strong foundation for the social norms, and number two. Well, divinity, according to him, is the source of goodness. So, boom! If you can prove that, then you have a product. You have this the, the this propaganda in a good sense, right? You, you have this package that people are going to say, "Yeah, you know, that, that's good. It's logical, and it provides the foundation." Mm -hmm. And we can't argue against goodness because goodness is, you know, God is goodness. And if you can prove it, if you can you know, put all the tie all the dots together yeah. then it's a solid proof like a bulletproof you know theory but mm -hmm. what um um makes me a, a little uneasy there is like um there, there seems to be like he puts too much effort on on the so on getting to that the social mm -hmm. um justification for the social norms right um without giving the account maybe that hey we're we are still um considering different <laughs> metaphysical mm -hmm. alternatives mm -hmm. you know like hey mm -hmm. it's like almost he's rushing to to convince mm -hmm. in sweden give this you know easy pill for his opponents right mm -hmm. but where's the truth in terms of the structure of his of his metaphysics because i mean plato is a very easy target or someone who's looking for consistency, right? For theoretical consistency. Mm -hmm. So that's it's just a kind of a yeah. side note, really, yeah. for me. I'm not I'm not disagreeing. I, I in fact I like I that's what I appreciate yeah. in Plato is that he gives different different pictures of how mm -hmm. the universe came about and so on. But it's not it's not consistent. And then mm -hmm. he's also like to me he's almost like rushing with. Yeah half cooked product yeah. to 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 convince his opponents well let, let, uh, let's let's see where that goes because i think we have to keep that in mind as we read uh the the dialogue you know is he advocating for something i think is one of the questions you're asking and uh you know is he trying to engineer something uh or you know maybe he's trying to bring into focus the primacy of the soul. You know, I think Plato throughout his dialogues has been very consistent in his concern for the soul. And this is maybe a concern that's reflected here. But, you know, I, it's really a question of what we think our role is with respect to these three interlocutors in this dialogue. We need to examine them. We can't, we can't accept at face value what they say. I think we have to exercise our reason here. So I, th I think you raise that point, you know, is he trying to engineer something or do we need to engineer something with these words and the situation that he's putting us in? So, so thank you for that. I think that's, that's important. We need to follow that line and, and make sure that we're all on the same page with that. Um, I'll go to Darren um, relatively briefly. And then if we sure. can really just do this reading, because this is a long yeah. reading, unfortunately, but <laughs> it's an, it's an important one, a very important one, which we'll have to continue to the next uh, discussion in two weeks. Yeah. Okay, I, I'll try to make this uh, brief. Um, I wanted to respond to what Clem was just saying. Um, I found it really interesting. Um, it also just sort of stimulated some thoughts for me that might interest others too. So Clem is, you know, asking like, is Plato trying to like engineer or or mold a certain metaphysics for his political purposes? I like I I actually want to push the question further back a little bit, in that I think the kind of metaphysics that's coming up here regarding God. And as we see in the passage you just read, it seems very much related to um, the possibility of, you know, something universal um, like justice or uh, the good. Um, I feel like he's trying to give us enough metaphysics so that we can have a political purpose in the first place. So by which I mean that there can be even argument about what is good or true regarding politics, because otherwise we see in the, in the passage you just read that, as you know, that passage says, uh, men are always wrangling about their moral standards and altering them. And every change introduced becomes binding from the moment it's made, regardless of the fact that it's entirely artificial and based on convention. That's the alternative view. So 
on that view, there's no standard justice, anything, you know, you can get away with and just sort of, you know, fool other people with that is the what is that's literally what is just So basically it doesn't exist. So, but I think he's trying to give us enough metaphysics here, like in, he's want to give us meta, enough metaphysics here so that we're, we're able even to talk about or um, to say that or give justifications for what is good or true in the domain of politics, which for him, you know, is the domain of us <laughs> living together mm -hmm. and not going to war and killing one another. Um, and just just finally, a quick point is that this ties in with something Micah was concerned about before, like about our need for a common system of values and something, you know, something in common for us. And I would open the question here, which is uh, regarding what might be coming up, is that just how much metaphysics is really here in the end? Like, what is he asking us to believe in? And like, how, like, how much does it, um, how, how significant it is? And like, he, 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 as I said, I think he needs, he wants to have this metaphysics in order for us to even have political purposes in the fir first place, you know, in, in the sense of being, there can be argument about what is good or true in politics. But maybe that metaphysics isn't that as thick, maybe is the, the word that I'm looking for, as, as people fear it is. And so maybe instead of being, <laughs> this maybe Michael won't like this, but maybe instead of being opposed to a sort of modern worldview, maybe the overall vision here is kind of could be seen as compatible with it in the sense that maybe the metaphysics turns out to be quite thin in the end but i don't know i'm just yeah. proposing this idea and just a tiny bit of evidence I i'm done with this tiny bit of evidence with for this would be that when he's responding to these young people he tells them that maybe they can hold off on their beliefs about god because you know he talks about how you know he's never seen someone who grows old and then continues to be an atheist and so you know maybe you can just like not think about it or something like that for now but like if that's the case then maybe like how important is the fact that this is this is in the laws like how thick or substantive is this metaphysics really so i'm just posing that as a question well that's good and, and you know the calling into question the idea of the purpose in the first place in the first place is an interesting term that you use because i'm going to talk about that in this reading what came first and so maybe this idea that the soul is the first thing that came into existence, maybe that's the purpose. The laws should be for the soul. Um, and, you know, this question of nature versus convention, you know, nature, if we understand nature to be primarily the soul, which he said in an earlier part that I read, that the soul is preeminent, preeminently natural, then this discussion of nature versus convention and these conventions changing all the time, this brings us back to the cradleus, what they talked about in terms of the meaning of words, right? And going, is it a question of nature or convention? How does how does the soul's language come about by nature or convention? So I think we're seeing this nature or convention question here too. So so you know, thank you for that. And so let me let me dive into this reading and see how far we get here. So this is the part from 893C to 896E, it's a long part, so we'll see how far I get. Um, so this is the proof that the soul came first. We'll see what we think of it. The Athenian says, suppose someone asks, sir, do all things stand still and does nothing move? Or is precisely the opposite true? Or do some things move while others are motionless? My reply will be, I suppose some move and others remain at rest. So surely there must be some space in which the stationary objects remain at rest and those in motion move? The Athenian replies, of course. And they say, some of them presumably will do so in one location, others in several. The Athenian says, do you mean we shall reply that moving in one location is the action of objects which are able to keep their centers immobile? For instance, there are circles which are said to stay put, even though as a whole they are revolving. Yes, they say. The Athenian goes on, and we appreciate that when a disc revolves like that, points near and far from the center describe circles of different radii in the same time. Their motion varies according to these radii and is proportionately quick and slow. This motion gives rise to all sorts of wonderful phenomena, because these points simultaneously traverse circles of large and small circumference at proportionally higher low speeds, an effect one might have expected to be impossible. You're quite right, they say. When you speak of motion in many locations, the Athenian continues, I suppose you're referring to objects that are always leaving one spot and moving to another. Sometimes their motion involves only one point of contact with their successive situations, sometimes several, as in rolling. 
From time to time, objects meet. A moving one colliding with a stationary one disintegrates, but if it meets other objects traveling in the opposite direction, they coalesce into a single intermediate substance, half one and half the other. Yes, I agree to your statement of the case. Further, such combination leads to an increase in bulk, while their separation leads to diminution, so long as the existing states of the objects remain unimpaired. But if either combination or separation entails the abolition of the existing state, the objects concerned are destroyed. Now, what conditions are always present when anything is produced? Clearly, an initial impulse grows and reaches the second stage, and then the third stage out of the second, finally at the third stage presenting percipient beings with something to perceive. This, then, is a process of change and alteration to which everything owes its birth. A thing exists as such so long as it is stable, but when it changes its essential state, it is completely destroyed. So, my friends, we've now classified and numbered all forms of motion except two. I'll just stop there briefly. Um, I know Steve has your hand up, and, and I'll just, um, I just want to just recap uh, before we go to Steve. Some of what I think is the important things that he's getting at here is this question of motion. What caused motion in the first place? And how does motion transmit in the universe? So we have these physical objects, which we now know, according to Newton's second law of motion, that action is always met with equal, equal and opposite reaction, at least in the physical realm. So that what one thing does, it will react, there will be a reaction from another thing, equal and opposite measure. So if everything is equal and opposite in its action and reaction, why is there motion at all? Why, why doesn't it just all cancel each other out? So I think he's really asking, as motion is transmitted from one thing to another to another, the question is, what started the motion in the first place? Has science ever proven that? So I think this is one of the things. And you know, when he talks about this motion gives rise to all sorts of wonderful phenomena because these points simultaneously traverse circles of large and small circumference, there's a particular point about spherical geometry here that we now know, which is rotational symmetry. So you put one circle in motion, it will transmit that motion to all the other circles. That's rotational symmetry. And we know the physical constants of the universe now are subject to universal laws of symmetry. So I think there's some some geometry happening here that is he's really trying to point us to some very fundamental principles of the universe about motion. And we have this problem about bringing these cities into motion, the colony into motion, motion being defined in the Theotetus as either a state, a change in uh, a position, a change of spatial position, or a change in state. So that, that's how motion goes in the Platonic world. So uh, I'll just briefly stop there at that point. And, and Steve, you had your hand up. Uh, I don't know, was it, was it about this section or a preceding section? Uh, if you want to go a little bit further, I can hold off a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me, let me read a little bit further then. Um, or Alain, did, did you want to make a comment about this section? Yes. I do have a, um, okay. a sort of radical pushback in terms of What's going on here as far as rhetorical devices, or well, what we could say is going on here in terms of logic, mm -hmm. ontological commitments. I think Plato's logical commitment here is that um, he needs to establish that something needs to be put in motion. And so that that's a sort of very deep-seated position himself as uh putting something forth now it could be that at that particular epoch uh it was a major insight for the physics but sort of looking back i see it as as somewhat of a sophisticated move on the part of plato himself uh to kind of presuppose an ontological beginning one that kind of is signaling the idea of things that are still, for one, need to be put in motion. Definitely. I, I think that that's the case. You know, he's trying to understand what the first event was, I think, right? So, yeah, let's look at this and let, let's consider that, you know, depiction of the circle that I have on the screen. I, what I was trying to get there was the idea of a pixelated circle, a circle that consists of just points all around, right? Points all around a common center. And 
what he's trying to say here is that if you take any of those other points and you draw a circle around it, you have circles on circles, right? So I think there's some particular logic about what could happen in this. And we remember his Plato's cosmology is that the, the universe is spherical, right? So if there's a spherical universe, then this has some particular relevance. The way circles work and the way motion in circles works has particular relevance, I think, to that. Um, Steve, did you want to say something about that? Yes. Well, I think the, the whole idea that, you know, his geometrical view is, it's just, it's a, it is a metaphysical view. It's just like a, it's a, like a religious view. It's a myth that, you know, it's based on the geometry of their time. And, you know, the idea that we're going back to is, should there be laws about, you know, that if there is some ultra, ultra, ultra great proof that there's a world soul, everything is going to be great. But then you're saying still the idea that you should be able to force people to believe in any specific instance. I mean, there's multiple people from all over the world that don't believe in the idea of, of a soul. Uh, you got Buddhists that believe in no self. They, they believe there's no Atman, you know, and these geometrical configurations and Pythagoras based and, you know, ideas are showing that there are certain things that get done geometrically, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's the, that that's how the, the actual world works. By Plato saying in his mythology that the universe is circular, it's like, so if you're at the edge of that circle and you reach your arm, are you outside the universe? It's like, you know, most cosmology is that the universe is infinitely large, you know, that the limits of where we can get to is based on the time and relativity. So I think the, the idea that you have a choice between uh, virtue or might makes right is completely wrong, that this city that they're talking about had slavery. It was considered part of the system. It was considered part of the virtue. Slavery wasn't ended because of some religion or some proof. It was ended because over time people had empathy and used rationality. So I think that, you know, the basic principle is still that what are the purposes of law? Should laws be used to make people virtuous? Or should laws be so that they can allow people to pursue what they consider to be a virtuous life as long as they don't do harm to others? That is the question. I think that's very much the question. Um, and, you know, we, I think the jury's out so far in, in this discussion. The jury is out. We can't conclude either way. But I think what he's pointing to is that this understanding of or, or accepting the idea that the soul came into being first could potentially change things. Right, because uh, because what's good for the soul is also good for the laws, and the question is, what's good for the soul? Then, uh, so it, you know, what is the good? So, if you uh, don't believe that that principle, then what? Then you yeah. get put into isolation for five years, or put the well, yeah. Let Let's look at what they come up with <laughs> in this dialogue. I mean, they they come up with some pretty harsh punishments. Right. So, is yeah. it? I mean, but the bigger principle is: should we be trying to enforce on people your belief because of mm -hmm. your mythology. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're thinking it's mythology. Um, I don't necessarily... Or think... the belief system. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I won't yeah. use a derogatory. Yeah. There, his, Plato's belief system is yeah. really different than so, somebody that's a Muslim or a Hindu or, you know, any of the other religions around the world. And what is his argument that, mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you do to people that's it's been happening... Through, just look at the colonization of the mm -hmm. Americas. The uh, Europeans that did that, they thought that they were working in the best interest of the natives, of the savages, and mm -hmm. they were taking them to a great life. That's the justification they used mm -hmm. for slaughtering them. That's enough for my, uh, I'm mm -hmm. done, go, go carry on. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. I, I think that's, you know, these are important points. You know, and, you know, when you say that science has concluded that the universe is infinite, it's actually... I've seen, it was Stephen Hawking collaborating with, uh, and I forgot the fellow's name, 
but you know they actually came up with a theory of a border so they they're exploring the idea of a border to the universe and then what's beyond the border maybe space and, and space is something that comes up in this dialogue too so we need to consider that maybe some of the science is not settled you refer to the geometry of their time you know that time was the time of pythagoras and without pythagoras we wouldn't have had the theory of general relativity that simple statement that a squared plus b squared equals c squared in a right angle triangle has led to massive discoveries and so you know is knowledge linear i think that's a this question we've come across before in plato uh, in the Critias, uh, we talked in just before um, our Christmas break, we talked about the nature of time in the Critias. So, you know, maybe knowledge is not necessarily linear. Maybe there's some core knowledge and the core knowledge in a universe that can be described geometrically, maybe geometry. And maybe this is what he's trying to get at here. Some just fundamentally geometric logic that would have universal application. So, I think we need to understand this section. We're not going to get to the end of it today, uh, and I'll start our next meeting with this section, because I think it's really important that we appreciate what's being said here. And if we don't believe what's being said, I would like to hear an alternative explanation. I don't want to hear that science has disproved all of this. If it's disproved, where is it disproved? What What is wrong with this explanation? Let, let's get at that. I think that would be that would be helpful, at least to me, because I I'm believing this, actually. Um, so thank you for raising that. I think these are questions we need to answer. We absolutely have to confront them. So we have, uh, we're five minutes left in the scheduled time. Maybe we can go, because of the disruptions at the beginning, maybe we could go an extra 10 minutes if everybody's okay with that. So that would give us 15 minutes if we're okay with that. So we'll go Klim, Darren, and Elan, and then I guess we'll probably have to end the discussion at that point. So Klim? Sorry, could I ask, could we, could, do you mind finishing the reading first? I don't know how long that will take, but if we can. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be I'm, happy to Yeah, I'd be happy to finish the reading. Well, all right with everybody, because it's nice to yeah. finish off the completed bit and then discussion yeah. and feel like okay. stopping. Yep. Yep, okay. I agree. I agree. Let's finish. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So um, I think I left off uh, when he talked about things are rolling. So then he goes on. So my friends, haven't we now classified and numbered all forms of motion except two? Phineas says, which two? My dear chap, they're the two which constitute the real purpose of every question we've asked. Phineas says, tried to be more explicit. The Athenian says, what we really had in view was a soul, wasn't it? Phineas says, certainly. The Athenian says, the one kind of motion is that which is permanently capable of moving other things, but not itself. The other is permanently capable of moving both itself and the other things by processes of combination and separation, increase in diminution, generation and destruction. Let these stand as two further distinct types of our complete, in our complete list of motions. Phineas agrees. So we shall put ninth, the kind which always imparts motion to something else and is changed by another thing. Then there's the motion that moves both itself and other things, suitable for all active and passive processes and accurately termed the source of change in motion in all things that exist. I suppose we'll call that the tenth. Clinius says, certainly. Now, which of our roughly 10 motions should we be justified in singling out as the most powerful and radically effective? Clinius says, we can't resist the conclusion that the motion which can generate itself is infinitely superior and all the others are inferior to it. Well said. So shouldn't we correct one or two inaccuracies in the points we've just made? Clinius says, what sort of inaccuracy do you mean? It wasn't quite right to call that motion the 10th. Why not? It can be shown to be the first in ancestry as well as in power. The next kind, although oddly enough, a moment ago we called it the ninth, will put second. Clinius says, what are you getting at? Clinius says, this. When we find one thing producing a change in another, and that in turn affecting something else, and so forth, will there ever be, in such a sequence, an original cause of change? How could anything whose motion is transmitted to it from something else be the first thing to effect an alteration? It's impossible. In reality, when something which has set itself moving affects an alteration in something, and that in turn affects something else, so that the motion is transmitted to thousands upon thousands of things one after the other, the entire sequence of their movements must surely spring from some initial principle, which can hardly be anything except the change effected by self-generated motion. Clinia says, you put it admirably. 
and your point must be allowed. Now let's put the point in a different way, and once again answer our own questions. Suppose the whole universe were somehow to coalesce and come to a standstill, the theory which most of our philosopher fellows are actually bold enough to maintain, which of the motions we have enumerated would inevitably be the first to arise in it? Response, self-generating motion, surely, because no antecedent impulse exists. Self-generating motion, then, is the source of all motions, and the primary force in both stationary and moving objects, and we shan't be able to avoid the conclusion that it is the most ancient and the most potent of all changes. Whereas the change which is produced by something else and is in turn transmitted to other objects comes second. Clinia says, you're absolutely right. Athenia says, so now we've reached the point in our discussion, here's another question we should answer. What? If we ever saw this phenomenon, self-generating motion, arise in an object made of earth, water, or fire, alone or in combination, how should we describe that object's condition? Clinia says, of course, what you're really asking me is this. When an object moves itself, are we to say that it is alive? Athenius says, that's right. It is emphatically alive, says Clinius. Well then, the Athenian continues, when we see that a thing has a soul, the situation is exactly the same, isn't it? We have to admit that it is alive. Yes, exactly the same, Clinius answers. Now, for heaven's sake, hold a minute. I suppose you'd be prepared to recognize three elements in any given thing. What do you mean, says Clinius? Athenian says, the first point is what the object actually is, the second is the definition of this, and the third is the name. And in addition, there are two questions to be asked about every existing thing. Two, asks Clinius. The Athenian responds, sometimes we put forward the mere name and want to know the definition, and sometimes we put forward the definition and ask for the name. Clinius responds, I take it the point we want to make at the moment is this. What, says the Athenian? Clinius responds, in general, things can be divided into two, and this is true of some numbers as well. Such a number has the name even, and its definition is a number divisible into two equal parts. Yes, says the Athenian, that's the sort of thing I mean. So surely, in either case, whether we provide the name and ask for the definition, or give the definition and ask for the name, we're referring to the same object? When we call it even and define it as a number divisible by two, it's the same thing we're talking about. It certainly is, says Clinius. So what's the definition of the thing we call the soul? Surely we can do nothing but use our formula of a moment ago, motion capable of moving itself. And Clinius responds, do you mean that the entity which we call the soul is precisely that which is defined by the expression self-generating motion? Athenian says, I do. And if this is true, are we still dissatisfied? Haven't we got ourselves a satisfactory proof that soul is identical with the original source of the generation and motion of all past, present, and future things and their contraries? After all, it has been shown to be the cause of all change and motion in everything. Plinius says, dissatisfied? No. On the contrary, it has been proved up to the hilt that soul, being the source of motion, is the most ancient thing there is. The Athenian says, but when one thing is put in motion by another, it is never thereby endowed with the power of independent self-movement. Such derived motion will therefore come second, or as far down the list as you fancy relegating it, being a mere change in matter that quite literally has no soul. Critias has correctly argued. The Athenian continues, so it was an equally correct final and complete statement of the truth when we said that soul is prior to matter, and that matter came later and takes second place. Soul is a master, and matter is its natural subject. That is indeed absolutely true, replies Clinius. The Athenian says, the next step is to remember our earlier admission that if soul were shown to be older than matter, the spiritual order of things would be older than the material. Certainly, says Clinius. So habits, customs, will, calculation, right opinion, diligence, and memory will be prior creations to material length, breadth, depth, and strength, if, as is true, soul is prior to matter. Unavoidably, says Clinius. And the next unavoidable admission, seeing that we are going to posit soul as a cause of all things, will be that it is the cause of good and evil, beauty and ugliness, justice and injustice, and all the opposites. Clinius says, of course. And surely it's necessary to assert that as soul resides and keeps control everywhere, where everything is moved, it controls the heavens as well. Naturally, says Clinius. One soul or more than one? I'll answer for you both, more than one. At any rate, 
we must not assume fewer than two, that which does good and that which has the opposite capacity. So that is that long section with what I find some very interesting logic. So I guess we need to set the stage for our next discussion in two weeks, where we want to maybe pick up on this logic and probe it and see if we agree with it, see if we can find any holes in it. Um, I don't know, has, has he adequately proved that soul came first based on the argument of self-generating motion in terms of what started the universe going in the first place? If physical matter came into being and every action has an equal and opposite reaction in the physical world, well, why did motion grind to a standstill? That's the question I have. So if we want maybe just another 10 minutes here, we could take Clem and then Darren and then wrap up our discussion today. And, and then we'll look at completing book 10 uh, in our next session in two weeks. So Clem, your thoughts. Thank you, James. Yes, definitely. I would prefer that we discuss this logic because there's a there's a lot of logic and then this is really the centerpiece of this whole dialogue um so i would prefer that we discuss it next time and we would have more time because there's there's a lot in there just like you said um i, mean, I could right now i could just offer just a few of my thoughts on it they're obviously not final and they will be probably modified as uh, other folks will express mm -hmm. their their opinions but here's the first, and I'm struggling with this every time I read Plato. And in the last discussion in the Timaeus, I've had a similar um, observations of a, of a similar nature on, on his uh, metaphysics. There appears to be a gap, like he's, he's dealing with two realms. That's just generally, let's put it quantitative and qualitative, right? And there's, to me, there's this gap between those two realms that he is maybe not too careful to discuss, right? Like, like how do you join the two? So here, here's an example for this particular uh, bunch of paragraphs that we just went through. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I actually like his argument of using motion, right? And, and finding out that, yes, there should be this original motion, right? That's the, the source of everything. That's, just if you take that argument in itself it's it's pretty good right but then if you try to connect that to the soul right motion to the soul that's where um more questions you know i feel like personally i feel like more questions have to be answered or, or considered for example motion for us you know like the first thing that it implies for for us for modern folks right it implies space. So where is the motion? Where is the motion happening? Well, it, it should be happening in space because that's how we think of motion. Unless Plato means here something more than just spatial motion. Like let's say, oh, we all know this phrase, movements of the soul. Um, now, what are the properties of the soul? Well, you know, we it could be like happiness, rage, thinking, all of that is non-spatial. Right, so you see where I see the, the disconnect. So unless Plato is thinking of motion as something more than just a spatial phenomena. Um, Maybe I'll just interrupt there briefly because uh, at the beginning I was talking about the Theaetetus and where in Plato's cosmology, motion is not just a change in spatial position, but it's a change in state. So water turning into vapor, for example, would be a motion. Right, right. Um, so, yeah. In that sense, I think it's more, um, there's more basis to it if you look at it that way. But mm -hmm. again, he's, um, it's either something in the translation or something between that the group of people, the Platonists, that is used as a terminology mm -hmm. where under a specific term, a broader number of terms is considered and it's, not discussed it's because it's just you know part of their convention their terminology right. but when we you know read this we immediately you see how they like my the modern mind comes with some obstacle when, when you try to uh, deal with the, the two realms but in any way here's another observation and, and maybe you know potential critique is that motion just the pure 
motion, whether it's mechanical, whether it's spatial or the original movement of a metaphysical soul, he equates that with goodness, right? Just the simple motion. And, you know, the, the soul is the, the source of goodness. Now, why, why should that necessarily be good? Well, just because the, by definition, sort of like the original, um, the presupposition that there's this first original motion or the movement of the soul or that this higher being should be good. Well, because, because why? Because it's, it generates this whole universe by being the first motion. Uh, maybe, but then he's not necessarily making that argument very explicitly, right? So there's something like between the lines there. And that's what, that's what I'm personally struggling with. So another thought on that is, is that the idea of movement, the example of movement that he's using to make his argument for the existence of the divinity and, and, and the soul, is that just an analogy? Or that is actually the ontological equality, like the motion is actually the, the goodness, right? So is this an analogy or is this you know, that's how we should literally perceive mm -hmm. it, right? So, so these are mm -hmm. my like preliminary thoughts on that. And I'm sure mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot more to that, that will be discussed. Yeah. Well, I'll stop here. Yeah, no, th thanks for sharing those. Uh, those are good questions. And certainly we need to def understand what is meant by motion. Um, I would just remind that last sentence there at any rate, we must not assume fewer than two souls, that which does good and that which has the opposite capacity. So not every motion that the soul does is going to be good. The first motion, I think he's saying is good, but all subsequent motions of the soul and all of our individual souls can break into two, good or bad. So, um, and it's really, you know, this whole idea of reconciling people is a, it's a question of harmonizing. And we'll see the term harmony appearing many times in this dialogue as it does in Plato's other dialogues too. So I think there's this need to harmonize the soul, probably harmonize with the original motion. And maybe that's why there's talk about needing to make, understand the nature, the natural source of the laws, which is the soul itself. Uh, so thank you for raising those questions. Um, so we literally just have a few minutes left. So uh, Darren and Elena, if, if there's some brief, comments maybe if you can just set the stage maybe for the next discussion okay um yeah i will try to make this quick um it's gonna be uh okay uh no, so... we, we can come back to we, we will be coming back to this so don't worry yeah. that, well, know, i do i do want to i do want to make this uh, i'll make this quick so it, it's tied to the question of what we were discussing earlier and seems to be a concern of a lot of people which is like how much religion or metaphysics is here and, you know, that has implications for the legitimacy of the laws and whether we should <laughs> accept this view and so on. Um, so I just want to maybe I, I'm going to try to do a like a charitable thing because I was I, I was saying maybe there's less metaphysics here than we think. Like, obviously, there's like there, there's various kinds of justifications you can provide, like just because one justification fails, like doesn't mean there can't be other ones. And I think the point is that, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the point is to believe whatever we're trying to prove not necessarily it's not it's not like the detail any specific justification that matters so here what i see is I, i'm doing a sort of a thin reading of <laughs> how much metaphysics is here is that um um so he's saying that the universe you know is a soul or has a soul because it's basically because it's like self-creating or self-moving you know the the argument here comes from you know he says like well when you see you know self-moving things on earth or whatever uh what do we call them when he says alive well alive. <laughs> well if it's alive well the the universe does this too because he's already said that you know it, there, there's this first cause for everything so in this sense the universe is alive or, and has a soul so i don't know how like it, it doesn't seem that thick of a metaphysics to me because by soul all we mean is what we have defined the words here to mean, which is that it, it has a self-creating thing. You know, it's not like some, you know, Christian idea or whatever, you know, whatever you want to build upon this word soul. It's just like this idea that it's self-creating and self-moving. And then, okay, so like, what is the point of all this as Steve and others have brought up? Well, it seems like the most important like aspect of this argument is to suggest that 
like you want to say that like what is like we have to go back to the very beginning of this argument right where he talks about art and how people think it's like secondary and that randomness and chance is is primary and, and of course there was that argument about how government and the laws and justice all that is just like artificial creations they're they're artificial they have nothing to do with nature mm. because they're created like literally so it seems to me the important part is that okay now that we've established that you know this soul the universe has a soul in this sense and because it's self-creating and that and so that is the first principle of the universe um then the fact that like we create the government <laughs> you know, with reason and all that doesn't make it like artificial. It doesn't mean like you can do whatever you want, because like, as we read earlier, whatever people decide is the law is going to be, that is the just thing. And then whenever someone decides something different, then that's a just thing. Like it's um, that. Yeah. But maybe I'm it's confusing a, myself now, but, it, it's, <laughs> he, I mean, but it's, he's getting at a, at a universal nature of justice, I think. Right. Yeah, like there's like, but he's trying to say that yeah, because like, like we can create it with reason. That it's not just yeah. some random arbitrary thing. Um, that it has a primacy, and the argument seems to be showing this kind of primacy that like yeah. the soul and self creation and this is and yeah. for Plato this is tied in with reason has a primacy, and so that just because government is created, because the the concern seems to be if if government is so called artificial and is created, then it's it, it's yeah. like secondary. It doesn't matter. It's like at one point he calls it like a shadow or or whatever. Here he reverses it. He's like, actually, if we create it with reason, it's actually primary. It's like just like the universe is created, we're just creating something that is like insofar yeah. as it comes from reason, that source, it has this sort of re universal import. Right. Well, I mean, let, let's let's see where that goes. I mean, certainly we need to understand what is meant by soul, and we need to understand the origin of motion and whether there is any superseding motion uh, and you know basically arrive at this conclusion whether the soul was in fact the first thing that was to be created so i think there's a number of things that he's getting at here that we need to explore and, and we need to talk about it a lot more um Alain, any brief thoughts before we leave yes uh, well it's definitely hard to follow darren i don't have much more to add I to that, um, just briefly, I wanna say thank you for reading and also some of the points that you made and also clean the points that he made were very apropos as far as, you know, your question around um, probing into it a little bit further and dealing with the logic. I think when you had summarized uh, as well, you had mentioned kind of the Plato introducing once again, probably, I haven't read a lot of Plato and don't get me wrong, even though, I'm trying to butt heads a little bit with him. I'm still not, you know, um, anti-Platonic in any way. I, I'm tearing with um, both this passage, which is really good in terms of introducing to physics. The few, the few concepts or ideas that I want to share is, one, there's the introduction of dualism, both kind of external and internal, uh, in terms of motion, as you pointed out, something that the Stoics later take up is uh, the idea, and, and you talked about changes of state. So this notion of how does the soul relate to us using that term and, and having it refer to a space or a dimension that deals with internalness. And then as you also pointed out, James, the aspects of uh, the geometry, you know, P Plato has this phenomenal capacity to kind of simultaneously like deal with uh, these different fields, right? So dealing with some of the cosmology and the, and the universal aspect of these questions around, is there some governing principle or is there a soul at work in this external level extending itself all the way to dealing with questions of cosmology? Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's that external, internal soul, the uh, intensity aspect, really kind of getting into whether or what are the qualities of it and he, and it seems from this passage that we have to deal with like he's applying these physics physical notions right whether it's dealing with the circle or dealing with the matter as well as a possible representation that is mathematical so there's a lot at play there and that's pretty much all i wanted to say i think mm. at this point and again the 
the big question is, does he introduce a kind of dualism or is that something that was introduced in other works of his? Because I, I haven't read enough Plato and it's also being kind of upheld here. And a possible conjecture on my part too is, is he doing an interesting, also subversive move where any talk about the gods is to kind of throw it into the realm of dealing with the politics and then assuming a new approach that deals with like the forms, math, physics, i.e. metaphysics, to deal with uh, the notions of um, the law. Mm -hmm. And I think you helped to encapsulate some of the questions that we can explore in our next meeting, and hopefully we'll have a chance to reflect on this long reading. I'll, I, I will post this episode before we get to our next meeting so we can all have another listen to this and ponder some of these questions. But, you know, you, you touched on the question of the internal versus the external. And I think that's a, a fundamental question. You know, do we think of the soul as external to physical objects, intrinsic to, you know, really what exactly is this concept of the soul and what's the connection to geometry, which is all throughout Plato. I mean, he was, as I keep saying in the introductions, he was a geometer as well as a philosopher. And there's some pretty profound geometry in this, like some pretty profound, like it gets right down to the quantum level. That that part that I highlighted in bold with the underlining, that to me gets down to the quantum level. And this is what is science is now exploring. So maybe there's some philosophy of the quantum level that uh, is important that we need to understand as well as the physics, uh, especially if the soul is the first thing in, that came into being, if the soul is the oldest thing. So lots of questions, not, not uh, any decisive answers. And I don't think we'll ever get to a decisive answer in this, but I think we can get closer to it. Uh, certainly this process of looking for the first principle, uh, this whole process of dialectic, which Plato was all about, you know, is the first principle the soul? You know, maybe this is, maybe that's fundamentally the conclusion of this dialogue. So let's see where it goes and see how he expands on that in the second half of book 10, as well as then we'll go back to the beginning and see how the whole dialogue develops. So I have a two hour presentation refuting this, <laughs> which I, I gave recently. So I essentially proved the non existence of the soul and the mind okay. uh, for, for a different group. And I'm going back to the same group in March where I'm going to defend the principle of essence. And it's the existentialist group that I'm presenting it to. Right. You know, well, the, the opposite of what I proved last time. I'm going to defend yeah. the opposite. Right. right. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take all the points that everybody has and uh, see if we can amalgamate them into some sort of interesting conclusion. So I want to thank everybody for being here today. And for yeah, contributing good. so much to the discussion. Yeah, it's it's been quite incredible, quite wide ranging and so much to think about for the next time. So I really want folks to think in particular about the section that I read, which was from, let's get the reference here again, it's 893C to 896E. So we'll pick up on some of these ideas at the beginning of the next session where we'll try to finish off book 10 and see what uh, kind of conclusions we can arrive at to position our understanding of the rest of the dialogue as we go back to the beginning. So thank you for this. We'll meet again in two weeks. And uh, for those who wish to stay online for a casual unrecorded half hour session of Plato's Cafe, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise I'll end the recording and uh, look forward to seeing everybody in two weeks. Thank you very much for attending today and contributing.